So this doctrine is known as TULIP. It's an acronym, and each letter stands for one of the doctrines that's known generally as Calvinism. And the first one is T for total depravity. That's the one we'll be discussing this morning. Other steps will adventure as we you know, get to them, but we're going to do one at a time. And this morning we'll discuss this first one. It's called total hereditary depravity. You might hear it called that. Hereditary should give you some inclination of what this teaches. Original sin is another name for it. Inherited sin, born in sin, and human inability. All those different names for it capture the essence of what's being taught in this doctrine that is traditionally called total hereditary depravity. Now this is important. This isn't just a scholastic endeavor to you know, make me sound smart or anything. That's not the point of giving this study. This study is very important to understanding why churches teach and practice what they teach and practice. And one thing that's commonly taught and practiced among major denominations such as Catholicism, Presbyterianism, and some Methodist churches is infant baptism. That's one fallout of this doctrine right here. Another one is the idea that children are born with a sinful nature. And from birth, they have the natural instinct to sin. That's a product of this. And that comes with consequences as well. So this morning, we're going to take this one piece at a time, and we're going to understand exactly how does this affect us in our understanding of God's plan of salvation, and really, in essence, how we should be evangelizing our children. If you were to ask somebody, are you a Calvinist? They're going to say, no. Okay? Most of the time. And uh, they don't realize that total depravity is part of the Calvinistic doctrine, the five-part doctrine. And so they might say they're not a Calvinist, but then they fully in, uh, delve into this and believe it with their whole heart. And it really comes in many different forms. I'm going to give you the most popular form first, the definition of the most popular definition of the word and doctrine. And then we're going to go through less popular but also uh, common beliefs of what this is. So first of all, this picture, I think, captures this most popular description of this doctrine. It's the idea that a baby is total and completely depraved from birth. Children are born guilty of Adam's sin with an unavoidable sin nature inherited from Adam. Sin has infected the human race so that from inception, the boy or girl has no ability to do anything towards his or her personal salvation. And they need some act of God to transform their sinful nature to a righteous nature so they can obey and be saved. Okay, that's the most common popular belief. If you see anything wrong with that, um, good for you. And if you don't, that's okay, because we're, we're going to find out what's wrong with that definition. This is the next uh, definition. It's, it's saying that kids are mostly depraved, but they're not totally depraved. It's the idea that children are born with a sin nature inherited from Adam, just like above, but children do not bear the guilt of Adam's sin. Uh, this sin nature prevents children from being able to do anything towards their own salvation unless... And they are in the need of God's grace. I may never answer this question, uh, but that brings up the question, did children need the blood of Christ? That's an interesting question. I hope that I remember to answer that, but uh, typically when I speak on this, I forget to answer that question. So remind me after church if I didn't answer that. The third definition, it's the idea that children are kind of depraved. Uh, they don't inherit any guilt or sin nature from Adam's sin, but just the same children are sinners when they break the law and Christ's blood covers their sin. So basically saying that children are sinners when they disobey the law of God. Um, that's assuming that children are accountable to the law of God. Okay? So those are three different definitions. But remember the first one. And just remember that generally speaking, people mean that children are so corrupt, they're so depraved from inheriting sinful guilt from Adam and sinful nature from Adam, they need God's grace. Now this had a, its roots and beginnings in around 410 years after the year of our Lord. And uh, there were two guys. They were named Pelagius and Augustine. They were both uh, Catholic scholars, if you want to put it that way. And Pelagius, sometimes I hear this word Pelagianism. People might call members of the Church of Christ Pelagians. I don't know if you've ever been called that before. But it's because Pelagius taught that children are not born with inherited sin. And they don't, um, or they rather they do, have free will. And Augustine, he believed quite the opposite of that. He said children are born in sin. Children are born without free will. And that really, Augustine is really the father. He was the first proponent of what is now called Calvinism. John Calvin got his thoughts from Augustine. And then John Calvin's thoughts were uh, popularized and made categorical by a guy named Arminius. 
And so it just kind of evolved over time, starting around the year 410 AD. And so this went on and was commonly believed Augustine was very, very influential in the church. He had Pelagius excommunicated from the church eventually, and, and he is a bad word in Reform uh, theology circles today. <laughs> John Calvin said in the 1500s, going along to how he phrased this, all of us, therefore, descending from the impure seed, that is Adam, come into the world tainted with the contagion of sin. Nay, before we behold the light of the sun, we are in God's sight defiled and polluted. We thus see that the impurity of parents is transmitted to their children, so that all without exception are originally depraved. And I, th I think I talked about last Sunday how um, the immaculate conception of Mary, the Catholic belief of Mary's, how she is to be reverent, reverenced, is the idea that the sin nature was transferred through the flesh, remember? And Christ was born by a fleshly woman, and for him to not acquire the sinful nature, what had to happen? So they came up with this miracle where Mary's nature was transformed into a righteous nature so that Christ did not inherit the sin. And uh, th that's only one doctrine that has been pulled out of thin air to explain away false premises. This guy right here, I really like listening to Vadi Bakken Jr. He's a very, very popular, influential preacher in the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, I'm sure there's many churches around here that know, if you mention his name, they would know exactly who you're talking about. Um, Vadi Bakken is a very powerful preacher, and he says a lot of good things, especially about the family. But one thing that he does get wrong, uh, and he's very bad about, is that he describes children as vipers and diapers. Uh, that's a really catchy phrase, catches the essence of the doctrine. And he says, our children must learn that they're sinners. They don't simply pick up bad habits, they sin. And we need to inform them that they're sinners and they need God's grace uh, from the, as, out of the womb. And this is just wrong. I'll tell you why. I mean, we'll get to that why, but I'm trying to you know, give a definition right now. But this is just completely and utterly wrong. And you can't believe this and hold to the opposite view at the same time. You can't believe, and we just, you know, all get along. One is wrong, one is right, and I, I may not be able to give you validation for this this morning. I may not convince you that this is wrong, but that's what I'm proposing to you. The theory would look like this, that in the Garden of Eden, uh, that's where Adam and Eve were planted. They were without sin. God created man. Well, they were the only people in all the earth at that time. Then Eve brought the fruit to Adam. They both ate. They sinned, and then that sin began to infest their seed. From generation to generation to generation. And now every single person on the face of the earth is infected with this sinful nature. That's what it looks like from a diagram perspective. The consequences of this, Augustine taught, he said, Such infants as die without being baptized will be involved in the mildest condemnation of all. Nonetheless, they will be condemned. That person, therefore, greatly deceives both himself and others who teaches that they will not be involved in condemnation. What that's to say is that when a baby dies and they're not baptized, they're going to hell. Uh, that's what this guy back in 410 AD is taught. Now, I was just talking to somebody uh, on Wednesday night, uh, me, me and uh, Rusty, and I think it was Karen, if I'm not mistaken. And we were talking, and somebody was talking about how they had some friend, their baby died. They were Catholic. Their baby died. It didn't have a chance to be baptized. I guess it was a miscarriage, probably. And they planted that baby in a little section of the graveyard for babies going to hell that weren't baptized. And then they later had a baby, and it died, but it was baptized, and they planted it in a section of the, of the cemetery where babies go to heaven because that baby had been baptized. That's the fallout of this doctrine. So if you think this is just an innocent little belief, that's a major consequence of this. So it's not innocent. It's not innocent whatsoever. In 1300 A.D., um, the Catholic Church theorized limbo. You may have heard of limbo before. It's the idea that babies don't go directly to hell. They go to this intermediate state, and it's not paradise either. It's just a, a third intermediate state, and this is called limbo where babies wait to be ushered into heaven eventually through the merits of somebody who prays for them or something like that. It wasn't a dogma of the church, but it was theorized by scholars trying to defend the Catholic faith on this issue, and... Just recently, in 2007, this doctrine has been kind of abolished by Catholic, mainstream Catholic scholars. But this was around for, for several hundred years. And uh, the International Theological Coalition of Roman Churches, their scholars finally said this about the issue. The question of the eternal destiny of infants who die unbaptized is one of the most difficult to solve in the structure of theology. It's only the most difficult thing for them to explain because it's a false doctrine and it's not in Scripture. That's why it's the most difficult thing to explain. 
Okay, this guy right here, and then we'll move on from introducing the issue. John MacArthur. Some of you have John MacArthur's book on your bookshelf. I've seen it on your bookshelf. That's okay. He, he writes a lot of good stuff. Uh, I read John MacArthur. But just realize John MacArthur is a 100% believer in total depravity. And so you're going to read in his book when you read it. And you may not realize you're reading it, but he's telling you children are born in sin, and uh, they are born with a sinful nature from Adam. He has a video. If you search that title on YouTube, I encourage you to watch it. It's like a three-minute video. It's not long. And it gives you a very eloquent presentation of this position about where do babies go when they die, aborted babies. And he makes the claim that they go to heaven. Now, how can he make that claim? Well, this is, how he, this is what it looks like. God is a holy and he's a just God, right? We know that. Scripture re reinforces that over and over. But God is also a sovereign God. And what being a sovereign God means is like when Jesus said in Matthew 28, all power has been given unto me. It means he has all power. He can do whatever he wants. But what we understand, you know, I as a Christian can do whatever I want, technically. But I only have the right to do certain things because otherwise it would contradict my character and God's character, right? So God is holy and just, but he's also sovereign. And so Calvinists like John MacArthur, they emphasize the sovereign aspect to the neglect of his holiness and his justice. And so they say that God is so sovereign and he's all-powerful that he can just elect to take babies who are born in sin and die in that situation and transfer them into heaven by his sovereign grace. And it sounds so good. But what it does is it makes God unholy and it makes him unjust because God cannot be in the presence of sin that's unatoned for. That would be unjust. God's not going to let you into heaven if you don't get your sins atoned for. If you don't meet the conditions for his salvation, it's just not going to happen. That's reinforced in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when children, if they are born in sin, God can't just let them into heaven. They either have to be baptized because they were born in sin. That makes sense. By infant baptism, right? That's why they came up with that doctrine. Or God violates his character and he's no longer God. What? He's Satan when he violates his holiness. That's what he would be. And so we understand the background so far. That's kind of catches us up to speed about it a little bit. And uh, now we'd like to move on to from the background and the consequences to the texts that are used to defend this doctrine known as total hereditary depravity. Now that's where the handout comes in. And Romans 5 is a major passage um, defending this doctrine. If it weren't for Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 and verse 19, this doctrine would not exist, probably. Um, so in Romans 5 and verse 12, the Bible says, Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. Now you read that and you think, that sounds exactly like what Augustine was teaching. Sounds exactly like what the Catholic Church has believed all these years. How are you telling me that's not saying children are born in sin? Well, what we've been practicing over the last few weeks is we've been practicing focusing on how people take one singular passage of Scripture and you lift it out of its context and you don't look at the passages that surround it or you don't look at the rest of Scripture that surrounds it and you can make one passage of Scripture make really whatever you want it to mean. That happens to the presidents all the time. Presidential speeches, people take one statement they make, lift it out of its context, and the president's saying things that he never dreamed of saying. That happens all the time. Now, I'm not defending any presidential, I don't, maybe there was a famous presidential speech recently, I don't watch the news. So I'm not ushering any uh, one side of Donald Trump's speech that he just made. But this is what people do with Romans 5 and verse 12. And then there's another passage, and it's um, Psalm 51 and verse 5. David is the writer. He says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Yeah, that sounds like the same thing. And those are the two major texts that are used by Calvinists, John MacArthur, Body Bakken Jr. today, and others to defend this doctrine that children are born in sin. So we need to look at them a little bit closer, and we need to understand exactly what was Paul writing, what was David writing, what was the situation they were writing in, and what were they saying. Maybe they were teaching what these guys are saying. And so we need to look at it a little bit closer. In Romans chapter 5, we're going to look at this verse, and we'd like to focus on I'd like to show you this diagram right now. This diagram helps me understand really visually what's going on in verses 12 through 21. And John Daniel just preached on this not long ago, so I'm going to try to make 
a five minute presentation of this or a 10 minute presentation of this. And if you study Romans 5 before, you know that that's a very difficult thing to do. So what I'm giving you is the bare bones and the summarized version. And like I said, John taught on it for four lessons. The CDs are in the back. I can make you one. And he did a good job on it. But I'm going to give you a short version. But what is going on here is that Adam is being compared with Christ. And both Adam and Christ did something, and it centered on sin. Adam did something, he committed sin. And Christ did something in a response to sin. And both of their actions had consequences that affected every single person from the beginning of time. Adam's consequences, I'm going to give you the hint, it caused every man to die physically from Adam on. And that's why every man physically dies today, is because of Adam's sin. That's what Romans 5 is teaching. Christ died on the cross, and, and what he did is he reversed the consequence of Adam's sin. And you say, well, people are still dying. So how did that happen? By the hope of the resurrection. Christ defeated sin. He's not dead anymore. He's in heaven. He rose from the grave. He was witnessed by over 500 people. And he ascended directly into heaven. And there he lives on the right hand of God. And so that's basically what's happening here. The consequence of Adam's sin was physical death, not spiritual death for all mankind. Now, he personally um, was lost spiritually but that part did not get transferred to all mankind. So we'll see that a little closer. In verse 12, let's go verse by verse, and let's examine this. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. What Paul's saying here is that Adam, as the representative of mankind, sinned and began to die physically. And he was the only person besides Eve on the whole earth. And they were the represent. And so when they sinned as the representatives, it was as if every single person and all the world that would later live, it's as if they took that fruit and they ate it themselves, and that's why people physically die today. And so that's what it means by all have sinned. All have sinned representatively in the Garden of Eden by eating that fruit. In verses 13 through 14, it says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. There, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him, who was to come. This is looking at a point in time in history to prove Paul's argument. He looks at the time period from Adam to Moses. And why is that important? Well, Adam was given a law, and the express penalty for breaking that law was you will physically die if you eat this fruit. In the law of Moses, this was the first time there was ever another law like the one given to Adam, where if you break this law, the express penalty for breaking this law is you're going to physically die. In the Old Testament, According to the law of Moses, if you committed adultery, you would be taken to the elders and stoned to death. If you broke the Sabbath, you would be taken to the elders and stoned to death. If you were disobedient to your parents, insubordinate to your parents repetitively, and of age, you were to be stoned to death. And there were many other laws where people expressed penalty was death. And so those two laws were very clear. The consequence of the breaking the law is death. In between that time period, there was no law with that type of expressed penalty penalty for breaking it. And so an outsider looking in, they might say, why are all these people dying? They're physically dying. Why, why is that happening? There's no law that says, you know, if you break it, you're going to die. But there was a law for Adam, and God told Adam, you and your offspring, from dust you are and from dust you shall return, to say that because you have sinned, now your entire offspring are going to physically die. And so from that time in between, we can see the only logical conclusion is that people are dying because of Adam. Not because of their own personal sin, but they're physically dying because of Adam. If you put one and one together, it equals two. And so that's what these verses are saying. Um, this graph right here kind of illustrates that. That middle picture is all the people that lived in between Adam and Moses. In verse 15, it says, But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by the one man's offense, Adam's offense, many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. And so you have these two people, Adam and Christ. And what Paul's saying is that Adam committed sin. He physically died. Christ reversed what Adam did 
And when he reversed it, Christ's act of dying on the cross did twice as much good as Adam's sin in the garden did bad, is what Paul said. Christ not only was able to reverse the physical consequence of Christ, or rather of Adam's sin, by giving us the hope of resurrection, but he was also able to reverse the, the spiritual consequences of our each individual sins. That's what he means, which came from many offenses. Christ, Christ had to die, not only because of Adam, but also because you personally sinned, and that brought spiritual consequences for you. And so he reversed both of those things. Christ did twice as much good as Adam did bad, is what he said. Now, verses 18 through 19, we're going to finish with these verses on Romans 5. Therefore, he's not saying anything new here. He's not saying, teaching any new concept that he hasn't already taught up to this point. He says, therefore, he's summarizing, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many were made or will be made righteous. It said many were made sinners. That sounds like total depravity. It's, he's saying the same thing he said back in verse 12. All men were not made spiritually guilty of sin or having a nature to sin. All men, they received the punishment as if they had eaten of the fruit themselves, and the punishment was physical death. Now, Calvinists would never say that all men are made unconditionally righteous and will go to heaven because of Christ's act on the cross. They would never say that. But Paul's making a perfect parallel between Adam and, Moses, or Adam and Christ. And whatever, however all men were made sinners, that's however all men were made righteous. How were made, men made righteous on the cross? Christ died, and every man is going to resurrect from the dead one day. And so Adam had one far-reaching consequence for his sin, and that is as if everybody ate of that tree. But Christ had one for, two far-reaching consequences of his action on the cross, and that was every man's going to rise from the dead, number one, as if they had been in the tomb for three days. And that's not to imply that they're all going to resurrect to life. Every man, good or bad, is going to resurrect, and they're going to face God in judgment. And that's where the sheep are divided from the goats. And then on the other side, the second part of Christ's gift was that he reversed spiritual consequence of sin. And if you're a sheep and you met the conditions and you trusted in God and his grace, then you'll be divided to the right and not the left. That's what Romans 5 is teaching. Romans 5 is not teaching that we're born in sin, guilty of Adam's sin with a sinful, corrupt nature. That would imply one of two things, and we covered it already, that children need to be baptized when they're born, to have their sins washed away. Or number two, that God needs to violate his own character of holiness and justice and sovereignly save them, which he can't do as God, if truly they have sin on their account. If you have a baby and you're wondering, maybe you had a miscarriage, and you don't know where that baby went, that baby's in heaven right now. If you don't know, if you have a child, and they, they, maybe they died at three or four years old, and you don't know, where did they go? They, they went to heaven, or paradise is where proper term, we should say. The second text is Psalm 51 and verse 5. And David's writing here, and he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. What's he mean? Well, if you look in your Bible, my Bible has a heading at Psalm 51. And that heading says something to this effect. It says, uh, When David committed adultery with Bathsheba. Now, those headings were added after the fact. They weren't added by the psalmist for what we know, according to historical documentation. But yet, if you read the psalm, it fits perfectly the context of when David committed adultery with Bathsheba. And David, he had Nathan come to him, remember? And Nathan told him, he said, he gave him an analogy, and, and uh, he said, you're the guy in this story that I just told you has committed the sin. And David was so distraught, he fell down and he began to pray. And we imagine he prayed these words to God, and he was so sorry for his sin. He was so emotional about it that he was saying things as if he was this evil. And he says, verse 51 and verse 5, uh, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. It's as if I'm so evil that I was sinning in the womb when I was 30 weeks old, in the womb. That's how bad of a person I am. In verse 7, we can see that it doesn't make sense that he's talking in literal terms, because in verse 7 he says, God, purge me with hyssop, and I'll be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Is he saying, God, I need you to take some hyssop, and I need you to scrub my back? And purge me. I need you to take some wash 
cloth and some soap, and I need you to wash me so that my skin is whiter than snow. No, he's not saying that. That's ridiculous. Verse 10, he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Is he saying, I need you to, to perform a heart transplant and take out my pump and replace it with a good one because I got heart disease? No. He's saying, I got a sinful heart. I have committed sin against you, and I need your salvation. Please save me. And in verse 5, he's saying, it's as if I've been sinning since I was a baby. Was he really? No. This is poetry, and in poetry we understand figures of speech are being used. Terms are not always literal. They're often figurative to relay the fact that's being emphasized in the poetry. And so to take this verse and to teach that your child is born a devil and deserving of hell is, that is sin. <laughs> that is sin. Those are the texts that are most popularly used incorrectly. And now we'd like to go on to the truths of the matter. And so the question is, why do children act like devils? <laughs> if all this is not true, Aaron, then why do they act such defiled creatures? And, uh, I'll tell you, you know, the answer is so complicated. They're kids, and their mind is this small. Their brain is literally that small. And you know what's going to happen to that brain? It's going to grow. And eventually this kid's going to grow something like this. And that brain's going to get a little bit bigger. And you know what we don't expect of a child? What we expect of an adult? Why? Because the brain is this small. And if you expect that of an adult, then your brain's that small. That's why kids act like devils sometimes. But you know what I see a lot? For every, now, this is the emotional argument that Calvinists make. They say, if you don't have kids, you don't know what I'm talking about. And, of course, I don't have kids, so I don't know what they're talking about, right? They said, if you've got a kid and you've seen it, they look in your eyes and you tell them, don't touch that. And they look at you. And they touch it. And they're being defiant devils. That's what they're saying. If you had kids, you would know. And it's an emotional argument. But you know what I see for every act of defiance? I see on Tuesday nights, very typically, two little boys, I don't know how old, how old Braxton, uh, five, six, and I see Henry on the couch, and they're cuddling and watching TV together. Oh, that's sweet. They don't look like little devils when they do that. Sometimes they do. But they don't look like it then. Henry's one of the sweetest little boys I know. And I wouldn't look at him and think, he's going to hell. No. But if you want to, you can lift one example out of the book, isolate it, and say, that kid's going to hell. If you wanted to. And you would be wrong. What we understand is that kids are immature, and they're going to grow up. And Paul told Christians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he said, you're immature. They were adults who had been baptized into Christ, and yet they're immature. Why are they immature? Because they were inherited the sin of Adam? No. Because they're immature. <laughs> and they haven't been practicing what's being, being taught. And humans, if you trust in God's grace, and you trust the fact that if whatever he says goes, and you do whatever he says, then you'll see growth. And you'll start to mature. And five years from now, you won't look like the same person. And it's not a miracle. It's the fact that you submitted yourself to God's authority and you did what he told you to do. And so why do kids act like devils? Because they're kids. That's why. It's not that complicated. I accidentally clicked this button. But this was the next slide. And I want to go over three texts that I would feel remiss if I didn't go over at least some scripture that said what kids really are. And Luke 18 is one of them. And it says in verse 15, Jesus is talking to his disciples and masses of people, and, and some people bring some kids to him. And he says, uh, Then they also brought infants to Jesus, that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and don't forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Those infants that you're bringing to me, if you are like that infant, you'll be in heaven. Because kids are what? Innocent. Kids are sinless. Kids are not accountable to the law of God. 
One day they will be, but they're not right now. And of such is the kingdom of God. Surely I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Matthew 18 is the same story from Matthew's perspective, and this is what he says in verse 10. We just covered this on Wednesday nights. And he says, Take heed that you don't despise one of these little ones, these children. For I say to you that in heaven their angels see the face of my Father who is in heaven. I don't believe this is teaching about guardian angels. In Acts chapter 12 and verse 15, the spirit of Peter is described as an angel. It's the same word. It's being used in the same sense. I believe that Jesus is saying little kids, their spirits, if they were to die, they would be in the presence of God because they're innocent and they're righteous. Become like these children. Become innocent and righteous so that you can be in the presence of God. That's what he's saying here. He's validating this belief that children are not born corrupt in nature. And last of all, Ezekiel 18, verse 20, the idea that we inherit the guilt of Adam's sin? No. Ezekiel 18, verse 20 says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. And so, Brother Delmer, if you go to hell, it's your fault. Uh, same thing for you. Brother Bobby, if you go to hell, it's your fault. It's not your dad's fault. It's not Adam's fault. It's your fault. And if you go to heaven, Danny, it's God. It's only by the grace of God that you go to heaven. Because you deserve to go to hell. That's what the scriptures are teaching us. And we could give more scripture and more scripture, but we're trying to keep this reasonable this morning in time. So let's can wrap this up or get closer to wrapping it up. Almost done. The conclusion of this is that babies are not sinners, and we don't need to baptize babies. In fact, there is no validation for that in Scripture anywhere. You'll never see a baby being baptized because babies don't need to be baptized. And to tell people that they need to baptize their infants is misleading people. It's teaching false doctrine. It's heresy. It has eternal consequences. Your child looks like that right now, maybe, but eventually they're going to look like that. And the application of all this is that no, your baby, your child is not a devil, and they're not totally depraved from birth. But you know what can happen is they can grow up, and unless you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, they will become totally depraved when they become accountable to God's law. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 9, Paul is describing himself in his youth. And he says, I was alive once in his youth without the law, but when the commandment came, when the law of God, I became accountable to it, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. I discovered this around the time I was 14 years old. I realized that I was breaking the law of God and the sin that I was committing in my life. And I started reading God's word and it was supposed to bring life. But I looked at it and I compared it with my life and it, all I saw was evil and death and I saw I'm condemned that's what Paul's saying here when the commandment came when he reached that age of accountability he looked in the law of God and he saw himself in a mirror he looked terrible that's the age of accountability and at that point your child needs the gospel I went to my father and I said dad I need to be baptized for remission of my sins because I had a lot of sin on my account and I needed it washed away and this morning I'm going to focus on you fathers once again, and I'm going to keep focusing on you. And if you feel uncomfortable, if you don't feel uncomfortable, I'm going to preach on it until you do feel uncomfortable, that you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility that is so high to train your children in the Lord. It's given instruction in Ephesians chapter 6. Your child's not born depraved, but they will grow up, and you have 18 years to make sure that they aren't depraved when they leave your house. And the Bible says in Psalms chapter 78, turn with me, turn out your Bibles, we're going to go to Psalm 78, and we're going to read the first four verses over there. The reason that the New Testament writers didn't harp on this idea of training your children in the Lord on every page of the New Testament is because it seems like on every page of the Old Testament, it's harped on. And the Jews who were converted to Christianity, they understood this because they knew the old law. And one of the things that the psalmist says, verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord 
and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. They committed to do that. How committed were they to do that? What did that mean exactly? Well, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 17 through 18, Paul says, uh, he says to Christians who are putting on the new man, living the new life, he says, redeem the time because the days are evil. You better put some time into making yourself into this new man and putting on, because the days are evil. And if you don't redeem the time, it's going to get away from you and you're not going to have time to do it. In uh, Genesis chapter 31 and verse 40, Jacob, one of the patriarchs, he's telling his father-in-law, Laban, he says, I kept your sheep. And when I was out there kept keeping your sheep, the drought consumed me and sleep caught up to me. And he lived with the sheep. He tr was with those sheep every day. He shepherded them so much that he lost sleep over it. How much energy, how much time does it take to train your child? It takes every second of every day. And if you're going through the week and you never sit down with your children and you never read the Bible with them, you never pray with them, you never instruct them in what God's law has for them so that when they read the commandments, they understand, I'm a devil. Then you are neglecting your responsibility. And it is so important for you and your family, and it's so important for you and your family, the church, that you take this seriously. This is so important. You have a responsibility, fathers, every one of you. Rather than just bring them to church, take church to the home and make your home a worship center to God so that when your children leave the house and go to school and go to work and go to their girlfriend, They don't have to think twice about what they should be doing. They already know. And they've been building habits. So it's second nature. You have a responsibility. And you don't look at the guys in the world and say, well, that father, I'm better than him. Well, great. You don't look at the other guys in the church and say, well, I'm better than that guy. Well, good. Because he's not very good. And you don't look at everybody else. You look at yourself. And what are you doing? And a lot of people help me with this lesson. They don't even realize they help me with this lesson. But if you're a father this morning and you have neglected your responsibility. Now, I'm not talking about you who your kids are gone. You, you know, and, and maybe your kids have fallen away. And you can't help that. And you pray to God and you ask for forgiveness. And he's forgiven you. But I'm talking about you that have children this morning. If you have children and you're neglecting your responsibility. I've already preached on this twice. And I'm going to preach on it again. You have sinned. Let's just call it sin. It is sin, and you need forgiveness. And if I have kids one day and I neglect that responsibility, I have sinned, and I need the forgiveness of God. And if you're too intimidated to come to me and talk to me because I'm the preacher, and you feel like Aaron is going to expect me to have done this, I'm not going to. I'm not going to yell at you. But if you think that that's going to happen, you're intimidated. Then I can tell you four guys to go to who we've been getting together on Tuesdays and Fridays, and we've been talking about this concept. And I know that their routines have changed. Go to Josh Hamilton. Go to Nathan Davis, go to Caleb Daniel, and go to uh, B. Blake, and go to them and say, I need help. What are y'all doing? Well, all you guys, but the church isn't going to be here in 2050 if we don't do something about it. Let's stand and sing. If you have a sandwich, let's make